even the background is a kind of political statement, right? Who's? <laughs> uh. <laughs> no, what I mean is that uh, sometimes I feel that uh, uh, scholars very carefully are choosing the background and some choose green background, like the forest uh. or something. Some shoes, some textiles, and and some paintings, and uh, I think that uh, because I'm going to to talk about the history historicizing, I should choose the background that is completely opposite to it. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Hello. Uh, yes, I, I I see Professor Carr. So. Uh. <laughs> and I was just saying hello. Um, okay, I think we begin. Um, so welcome everybody to this, the fifth session of the Essence of History seminar series. Today it is my pleasure to introduce Ava Domanska, who is both Professor of Human Sciences at the Adam Mickiewicz University in Poznan and visiting professor within the Department of Anthropology at Stanford University. Also since 2015, Ava has held the position of President of the International Commission of Theory and History of Historiography. Professor Demanska's research interests include comparative theory of the human and social sciences, history and theory of historiography, ecological humanities, and Ava is particularly interested in the critical and emancipatory potential of the contemporary humanities especially on the ways in which this scholarship approaches the past and on the social functions of history as an important element, element shaping attitudes towards the past and future. To these ends, Professor Demanska has authored, edited or co-edited some 24 books, including Encounters, Philosophy of History After Postmodernism in 1998, uh, Refiguring Hayden White, which she co-edited with Frank Ankersmith and Hans Kellner in 2009, and Necros, an Ontology of Human Remains in 2017. Her most recent book, History Beyond the Human, will be published later this year. I was absolutely thrilled then when she agreed to present a paper for this seminar series, and it's my privilege now to introduce Ava Domanska for her paper, Dehistoricizing the Past. Ava. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Aaron, for inviting me for this uh, excellent uh, series of uh, seminars. I congratulate you on this idea. The, the title itself is challenging, right? I myself uh, have to admit that I am a neo-essentialist and I, I do see uh, an importance of rethinking the idea of essence and what does it mean to speak about the essence of history after postmodernism, after uh, so highly, uh, uh, where the essence was so highly criticized. So um, I propose to talk about the historicizing the past because uh, historicism, of course, is one of this essence of historical thinking. So I thought that it would be an interesting topic. Uh, I would like to stress that I will present some ideas which are the work in progress. I mean, the work in progress, which is uh, constantly challenged by uh, contemporary events. And uh, as Aaron mentioned, uh, I'm very much interested in uh, critique uh, of uh, history, uh, critique of history as a particular approach to the past that was developed uh, within Judeo, um, Greek or Judeo-Christian tradition. And uh, uh, of course, from theoretical point of view, it's a very, very uh, interesting and stimulating, inspiring topic. However, when you look around and uh, you think how these ideas, which are actually challenging history, for example, criticism of anthropocentrism, criticism of historicism, um, uh, might influence uh, the shape of history in the future, I become to worry, especially because I am a scholar from East Central Europe, and you know what is going on with the war of uh, uh, Ukraine, in the war with the war in Ukraine. So speaking about 
you know, going beyond national history, going beyond anthropocentrism, going beyond beyond historicism, it seems to me a very uh, difficult task in terms of responsibility for history we uh, create, for responsibility for knowledge about the past that we as historians create. So for me right now, uh, it's a big challenge because, you know, uh, a lot of my work recent, uh, recently was devoted to uh, discussions about, you know, going beyond anthropocentrism. So today, I, as I said, I would like to present some uh, ideas uh, which are the work in progress uh, about the historicizing the past. And I would like to share with you uh, the presentation that I uh, prepared for today. Let me open it. So I will problem. Uh, okay, full screen. Is it working? Do you, do you see the slides? Yeah, we can see the slides, yeah. Yeah, the problem is I don't, oh yes, do. Okay. Oh, there we go, that's better. Thank you. Uh, so I would like to uh, begin with a kind of uh, general uh, statement that uh, uh, when I uh, did research about the condition of contemporary humanities and social sciences and what is going on since, to, since the year of 2000, which is somehow indicated as a symbolic uh, date for the end of uh, postmodernism, uh, what what was going on? Of course, this um, these ideas were already flowing around uh, before, but uh, after 9/11, it became much much more visible. Is this major paradigm shift, which is marked by uh, very dynamic discussions coming from many different fields? Uh, about uh, going beyond anthropocentrism, on creating a kind of non-anthropocentric uh, paradigm, going beyond Western um, uh, dominated uh, uh, science, um, becoming more uh, planetary oriented. So we're talking about planetary humanities. Globalism is not very much in fashion anymore because it's uh, associated with kind of uh, um, capitalism that we want to uh, uh, transcend. And what is particularly interesting uh, in the field of history, going beyond post uh, secularism. So the post secular turn in historical theory, and I have to say that I am very much. Uh, uh, surprise that not so many uh, historical theorists are uh, talking about post-secular turn in, in historical theory, uh, while I think that this is one of the major uh, tendencies in contemporary humanities. So I know that Alan McGill is talking about that uh, a little bit, uh, Dominic Lacapra, but not really uh, uh, much discussions about that. And of course, uh, this is quite quite strange, uh, taking into consideration that that history is supposed to be secular and 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 becoming less and less secular. Uh, uh, I think so. You know, these tendencies are marked by the key concepts that appear uh, in avant-garde trends in humanities and social sciences uh, uh, that are characterized by the prefix bio, eco, phyto, geo, neuro, necro, indigenous, techno, zo. And whenever you uh, encounter these terms, it means that I think that you are entering this uh, new way of, of uh, uh, thinking. Now, when I chose a couple of, uh, a couple of definitions uh, um, of historicists just to mm -hmm. Uh, begin our discussion today. Uh, so the one that I feel the, the closest to, to my consideration today is the um, uh, definition uh, formed by Deepesh Chakrabarti, who said 
that historicism is a mode of thinking about uh, history, a process of development um, uh, in secular historical time. And that's this idea that historicism is with secular, a historical, linear uh, time related also to theological thinking would be uh, of particular uh, interest to me um, uh, today. So um, in my research uh, and my empirical research is related to environmental history of mass graves and mass graves as a kind of paradigm on co uh, of contemporary history, political exhumations, that are my empirical field research. And so, you know, when I am, uh, when I'm researching this, uh, this uh, field uh, related broadly speaking to environmental humanities, uh, I, um, I am speculating how we can necessarily create um, alter various alternative histories. But if, and I am following Ashish Nandi here, if we can actually create an alternative to history, and this is a big question right now, uh, because as you might notice, uh, there is a uh, re reappearing interest in imagination. So before we were talking about rethinking history, for example, now we are talking about reimagining uh, re re history. So my question is, for example, do we have a histor as historians enough imagination to uh, think uh, about this alternative to history and how it would be, what it would be. I also ask myself, because I have to uh, admit immediately that even if I am interested in finding this alternative to history, I am very loyal to my discipline, right? I do not want to cut a branch on, uh, on which I am sitting. So I am very much interested in preserving autonomy of history in preserving the discipline, my question would be what elements of history, th historical thinking are actually worth preserving for this approach to the past that might in the future include history, but well, which would not necessarily be dominated by uh, history. And of course, as uh, for, for me as a theorist of history, uh, these topics are interesting because uh, they challenge all this basis of uh, history as we know it, as it was developed since 19th century as a, as a separate discipline with, uh, within academia. So it challenges uh, anthropocentrism, it challenges linear times, uh, the idea of uh, space, teleology, historicity, progress, the idea of historical sources, this dominance of the written historical uh, sources. And of course, I didn't put it here, but uh, it is obvious also the idea of truth as a kind of uh, main value um, and the task of historical uh, research. So when I'm talking about history, uh, I mean uh, this, uh, as I already mentioned, very specific approach to the past, which was developed within the Greco-Roman and Judeo-Christian uh, cultures, with this core uh, ideas, basis, fundaments, uh, which is anthropocentrism and historicity. So um, when I'm trying to find a challenge, I follow the idea of Audre Lorde, who said that the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. So I'm trying to find a way to approach these problems, but from outside of the discipline. Uh, I think that we are doing excellent studies in the field of history, in historical theory, to challenge these uh, um, ideas. For example, Marek Tan and uh, uh, Zoltan Simon recently are really doing great, great job in, uh, in rethinking uh, history from the point of view of the discussions about Anthropocene. It's very, very important. But I am taking a slightly different, uh, different uh, road. And uh, what, what I would, uh, would uh, uh, Sorry, what I would like to propose is 
to look at this problem of dehistoricizing the past, the historicizing the knowledge from the, uh, of the past, from two uh, two fields. One is indigenous studies, and the second is animal studies, because I think that they bring uh, very challenging uh, accusations uh, toward history. And of course, I will also follow a post-colonial approach to history, which is very you know, close to, uh, to indigenous studies and their criticism of history. So um, what, what I would like to, I mean, this is my uh, general context, uh, that uh, the, the current state of the world and the, the different crises, uh, they are really continuous and new crises are uh, appearing. Uh, this would challenge the history from another point of view, that history is really like fueled by conflicts. And of course, the conflicts might be uh, 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 considered as negative and positive. Uh, positive conflicts is this polemos that creates a kind of uh, uh, um, fresh discussions. But of course, the negative conflicts, I mean, like real conflicts in, uh, in the world, like wars and, and, and uh, terrorism and uh, um, forced migrations and so on and so forth. So the question is, what kind of approach of the past and if history as one of approaches to the past might be able, able to create such kind of vision of the past that would uh, um, that would help us to imagine more, let's say, positive scenarios of the future. Positive does not mean naive or unrealistic, but uh, um, the, the scenarios of the future that would prepare us more for various disasters to come, because we know that uh, we might accept, accept, accept uh, excuse me, expect uh, new crises and new uh, problems. So, how we can create this uh, idea of the past that would be uh, highlighted, uh, that would highlight the idea of coexistence, uh, coevolution. Uh, multi-species multi -species communities, but also somehow neutralize violence. So basically I'm speaking about how history and if history might be preventive in any way. And of course, this is the old question, but I, I have this idea that history has, as it is right now, has no survival value for human species whatsoever. It rather creates conflicts than neutralize them. So now, the, uh, to historicize uh, for scholars who are working on indigenous post-colonial approach to history means uh, to colonize, to turn subaltern subjects into victims. So uh, uh, Richard White, in his um, known article on using the past history and Native American studies, he said that historians recognized alternative ways of using the past to historicize them. And from his point of view, historicization means domestication. It's, it's like you know, neutralizing the critical edge and, uh, and somehow cannibalizing this alternative history that might potentially have emancipatory potential, but they, they are somehow neutralized by uh, historicizing. He also mentioned that, uh, that uh, all these uh, subjects that supposed to be outside history, like in the waiting room uh, to history, uh, they are perceived as, as victims. And this is also something that we want to avoid. And of course, the indigenous scholars are very, very, uh, very uh, um, sensitive about uh, these uh, issues. Uh, a lot of criticism uh, are coming also from Latin American, uh, let's say, uh, studies. And just one uh, very radical example uh, uh, that says that actually uh, history as a part of Western academia 
was uh, was contributing to uh, epistemicides. And epistemicide is very closely related to genocide. So if you look at this Ramon uh, Grossfogel uh, article, you will see that he said that the Cartesian idea, which is very strongly also uh, you know, present in historical thinking, uh, I think therefore I am, has been transformed in I conquer, there, therefore I am, and at the end, uh, uh, it looks like I exterminate, therefore I am. I find this, very, uh, uh, this article very disturbing, of course, for me as a historian uh, from Europe, but this kind of statements appear more and more often. So when we talk about the historic, uh, the historicization, usually this term would mean to remove from history, to deprive of historical context. Uh, I, this is not my approach, and I will talk about it in a moment. But you know, my question, the first question might appear, why we should uh, actually to dehistoricize the past? So what for? For whom? Uh, what is the agenda here? Why, why we need to, uh, to, to, to think about an alternative uh, to history. And of course, uh, if we follow post-colonial critique, this would uh, uh, be associated with the article I, I, uh, I was showing in a moment ago, that history is about, uh, is, a, is one of the instruments uh, of uh, this knowledge that support violence and exploitations, uh, and um, did actually uh, contribute to uh, colonization. But uh, what I would propose is to talk about the historicizing the past, and I mean here the historicizing the knowledge about the past, is to imagine knowledge uh, of the past where history has no dominant position and do not control our understanding of the past. And as I said, this is a kind of theoretical, for me, exercise. And um, for me, it's a theoretical uh, exercise. But of course, in academia, these processes are already going, uh, going on. Uh, because as I declare, I would like still to um, defend history uh, and defend autonomy of history. I think that it has an important role to play. But as a theoretical exercise, my question would be uh, how this past uh, knowledge of uh, knowledge of the past would look like without uh, history as a kind of dominant uh, approach to the past, and how the uh, knowledge of the past would look like without this fundaments provided by history such as anthropocentrism, Cartesian rationality, cause and effect thinking, linear time, theology, and human agency, truth. Hard to imagine. Uh, for me, it's, uh, it's very hard to imagine, uh, but that's, that's why I said that this, uh, uh, these ideas are just work in progress because I'm just struggling uh, with them. Uh, and I would very much um, uh, appreciate uh, your uh, comments and suggestions. So as I, as I declared, my approach to this problem would be from the point of view of indigenous studies and animal studies. But uh, since I am on the borderline between history and anthropology, I like the idea of anthropology of history, uh, which was developed by Charles Stewart and, 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 and others anthropologists who are talking about how anthropology could uh, actually approach some historical uh, uh, concepts and give us a different, different understanding of, of them. So for them, historicity, historicism is one of this uh, core idea, because as you, as you uh, uh, might remember, anthropology was always uh, somehow um, accused of stabilizing history, of not being historical enough, uh, so the question that Charles Stewart, and I highly recommend you this article on historicity and anthropology, what, what he's suggesting is that, um, that anthropology might help us historians 
um, to think about very different approaches uh, to the past and various temporalities that are associated uh, uh, with, uh, with these various approaches. Um, and of course, um, you know, he also uh, was talking about how historicity is uh, rooted in this post-enlightenment thought complex uh, and his stress that this has been um, developed in the framework of European um, 19th century uh, disciplinizations of various uh, disciplines. Different cultures, different historicities. Well, this is nothing new, of course, for historians, especially for those who are uh, uh, doing anthropological history, uh, micro history, like Robert Danton, uh, Natalie Zaymon Davies, and so on and so forth. But you know, from center, uh, center, uh, um, uh, some, some point of view, it might be mo more radical than it uh, looks like at the very beginning. Because uh, uh, what, what the uh, scholars working on anthropology of history, which is the anthropological approach to uh, thinking about history as a discipline, is to think about historicity as a kind of cross-cultural analytic uh, tool. And they ask if it's possible to use the historicity as this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, mm, uh, this uh, tool. But as I said, uh, it could be more radical than it looks like, especially when we um, enter the, the discussion about uh, the ontological term in anthropology and also in humanities in, uh, in general because the scholars who are advocating uh, ontological turn are talking about epistemological anarchism. This is the idea that comes from Eduardo Viveiros de Castro, uh, who said that in order to make these radical shifts uh, um, in, in, uh, uh, in the humanities social sciences, we really, uh, uh, we really should advocate this uh, uh, epistemological anarchism and to think about not different uh, uh, approaches to the past, but how very different ontologies or cosmologies are really challenging the basis of, uh, of historical thinking. So for him and for uh, scholars advocating ontological uh, uh, turn, cultural relativism is not relativistic enough. It's not enough to say that we have very different approaches to the past and, and uh, well, you know, we should somehow um, study them. Uh, so this, this has to do with the post-secular turn, right? And this is one of the probably more uh, interesting and challenging idea. So Paolo Haywood, uh, who, who is one of the scholars working on theological uh, term, he said that, for example, if we are talking about animistic uh, um, beliefs of indigenous uh, groups, we think like, well, you know, you can believe in uh, uh, that the, in the tree there are some spirits, but of course, these are your beliefs. Uh, I have my beliefs, and of course, uh, we end up in this problem of uh, tolerance and how we can tolerate uh, or accept different ontologies uh, in academic environment. That's what I mean, you know, in academic environment. So the question would be. Uh, how and if we are willing to make adjustments uh, uh, to accept the idea that there are actually some, you know, spirits that influence our world. And of course, we are talking about animists, but we can talk also about monotheistic uh, religions. And this is the danger uh, that I also see here. I mean, from theoretical point of view, it's a very interesting idea. From, uh, let's say, uh, my observation, what is going on in East Central Europe, in countries like, like for example, Poland or Hungary, when the right-wing politics is very, uh, very, uh, is very aggressive and is somehow pushing, uh, 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 um, let's say, the, the Catholic religion into academia, right? Forcing uh, some, uh, some movement in this direction, 
this would be quite uh, uh, quite dangerous uh, for for the future um, uh, condition of uh, academic uh, uh, work. But you know, I leave it for the discussion. So uh, yeah, I will. Uh, no, got into that. So now I would like to talk a little bit about how uh, how uh, animal studies are challenging our thinking about the past and how actually it's interesting that historians really do everything to historicize animals. This are their challenge, right? I mean, this was this was because before with people who were considered as being outside history to you know, bring them back to history. And after with the turn to things and materiality, we talk about how we can historicize things, material objects, uh, artifacts. And now there is this discussion about how we can historicize animals and you know, how uh, actually animals uh, are historical uh, uh, beings and how historians do not really have a proper meta language and tools, analytical tools to, to talk about, uh, to talk about the uh, animals. So one of the um, idea is how to historicize animal behavior. So, you know, for me, it's interesting because on one hand, animal history is one of these very challenging uh, field in historical studies. On the other hand, when, when, when I want to discuss the problem of dehistoricizing the past, instead of bringing some you know, uh, ideas that would help me to think about it, it just supports the idea of historicization and bring us back to this uh, idea that everything should have history or everything has history, uh, has hi uh, history and uh, uh, we should always historicize in uh, all possible uh, uh, possible ways. So, of course, this is the famous statement by um, Frederick Jameson uh, that uh, that uh, that said, "Always historicize." Right? This is a kind of basic basic um, uh, idea for us historians. And on the other hand, you have Deepesh Chakrabarti who says that we should really study the limits of historicizing and uh, perhaps we shouldn't historicize everything. And he said that, of course, uh, the problem is uh, in this uh, Frederick Jameson statement always, that we have always, uh, that we should always historicize. Yeah. So, uh, yes, so now, Again, you know, if uh, Frederick Jameson, I think, uh, would help us in this discussion as uh, as long as he strongly suggests that uh, that historical discourse is crypto theological, and uh, since we are not uh, particularly bound by uh, Christianity, uh, we should somehow. And neutralize this this uh, uh, this ideas which are associated with Christian historicism, which is theological time, uh, linear time, and of course the sec uh, um, non secular approach to history. So um, yeah, I mean that's again uh, for me one of the interesting issues that. Uh, that um, challenge history, and as I said from the very beginning, I am very much surprised that historical theorists are not really discussing the idea of post-secular turn and its impact on uh, historical uh, uh, historical uh, uh, studies. So um, yes, so uh, Western critique of historicism, uh, that's something uh, that, uh, of course, uh, Chakrabarty proposed. And um, the idea would be to uh, find a way to talk about non-Western uh, 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 non-Western ideas of historicism. My question would be, uh, again, that it might propose to us some uh, alternative histories, but not necessarily a challenge history uh, as a, a discipline. Um, because 
you know, when when we when we do this move again, we know this uh, uh, emancipatory potential of discussions of uh, about going beyond historicism as a challenge to history as a discipline. Um, the history, in effect, would transform, but not necessarily uh, be uh, radically changed or somehow neutralized as this dominant, uh, dominant uh, approach uh, to the past. Yeah, so um, this, is, this is again uh, what, what is the effect of my thinking from studying the uh, uh, animal uh, studies uh, as, a, as a field of interest for historians. Um, that, um, you know, this again would somehow uh, historicizing animals would uh, neutralize this uh, radical possibilities that uh, um, that are laying in in animals uh, in animal studies as a potentially um, uh, challenging uh, discipline for history, because, for example. It is quite rare that historians are going in uh, ethology and study how, for example, what is the animal's perception of change and do, for example, animals have, what kind of perception of change animals, and I'm speaking about in animals with developed neural system, uh, not all animals, of course. Um, uh, but how these different perceptions of change, or even generations, because some animals like elephants and and uh, might might, for example, have the the idea of generational change. So you know how, for example, the the ideas that are coming from ecology, from the uh, animal uh, uh, psychology, might help us to rethink. Uh, the basic concept of uh, historical thinking, and this is not very much that uh, that historians are um, doing. And what is actually at stake right now in contemporary humanities and social sciences? What I observed doing the comparative theory of the humanities and social sciences are just two tendencies. One is this uh, push to bridge humanities, social sciences with natural sciences, especially earth science and uh, life sciences. And this is something which is a completely different context than before when we were discussing integration of humanities and, uh, and natural sciences and ended up in uh, sociobiology and so on and so forth. That, that's, this, this move right now has a completely different, different context. And the second tendency, is uh, bridging humanities, social sciences with indigenous uh, 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 ways of knowing uh, and indigenous knowledges. And if these tendencies would uh, progress, this would, that, that this would really determine the future of humanities. It would change it completely. If not really, make some bigger change like erasing humanities and coming back to some ideas of artist liberalis or something that we had in in uh, before um, but you know perhaps this is the future the holistic uh, the holistic uh, knowledge that would uh, would consume all these disciplines um, and of course it was predicted long time ago when we were Called the sector. The subculture is not enough right now. That's uh, that's for sure. But anyway, so this uh, when when I uh, uh, revisit Frederick Jameson when uh, when he he was talking about uh, um, uh, historic historicity, uh, he also has this idea that memory studies that preoccupied uh, our. Um, mm, uh, our discipline and humanity in general uh, led to kind of atrophy of our imagination because we were really like focusing on the past and rethinking the past. Uh, but he asked at some point, 
uh, we do have enough imagination to um, imagine our disciplines and also imagine different scenarios of the future uh, in a different way, uh, taking a different points of view. And this is also my uh, my concern, you know, this this idea of reimagining um, the uh, reimagining uh, history. So, questions. And this this is uh, I am like approaching the, the end of my uh, presentation, or rather, random thoughts that I am struggling with. What are the legacies of history in the context of indigenous studies and animal studies? Uh, are animal histori uh, historically determined? Can we talk of indigenous approaches in the past and indigenous alternative, uh, history's alternative to history? Uh, can indigenous approaches to the past and animal studies inspire non historicist uh, ways of thinking about the past? So, um, can, uh, uh, what theology could teach us about animals' uh, approach to change and time? I would like to say uh, one thing that uh, um, that uh, that I learned uh, recently. Uh, I I'm at Stanford right now. And uh, uh, Robin uh, Wong Kimmer, a famous indigenous scholar, but a botanist, came to Stanford. There were thousands, thousands of people present in front of the uh, computer and on campus. And uh, what she was talking about, she was talking about exactly merging, merging Western uh, sciences with indigenous knowledges from the point of view of environmental knowledges. So that was a very interesting discussion. She also mentioned a known uh, uh, phrase, known uh, also from uh, Zen teaching, uh, a teacher comes when you are ready. Uh, so I, I was asking myself if we are really to learn from criticism that we went through during postmodernism on one hand, and are we ready in historical discipline to learn all this criticism that also uh, uh, came uh, recently via um, uh, posthumanism, which was even more radical than postmodernism? And uh, with this question, I would like to. Uh, uh, leave uh, uh, my uh, my presentation. Thank you very much. And as I said, this is the work in progress. So I'm sorry if the, some thoughts are not developed and maybe necessarily deeply uh, work through. But uh, this I just want to share with you my uh, my uh, say research problems. Uh, and I would uh, very much appreciate uh, your suggestions and criticism. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ava. You've given us an awful lot to think about. Um, and well, I'd, I'd like to open the floor then to two questions. Uh, Lawrence. So I have to remember to put my mic on. Um, Ava, thank you very much indeed for um, a, a, a fascinating range of, of questions and very, very broad. Um, what, one of the questions that struck me in your uh, going through your presentation, when I'm being asked to, to challenge things, uh, especially in the context of the discourses that you're raising, um, I always wonder, I mean, my question could be put like this, whose party am I being invited to? And what I mean by that, that, uh, that um, uh, when we start talking about emancipatory histories or when we talk about non-Western histories from within Western discourses, um, we also have to understand our own, root, our, our own rootednesses. That is to say, I want to be open to non-Western discourses, but I also have to accept that this is where I begin, because otherwise uh, it seems to me I dissolve any critical facility that I have um, of my own. 
in the name of something which I ought to be at uh, the party I ought to go to, as it were, without actually having any apparatus or any uh, 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 any apparatus with which then to enter enter the depart the, the the debate or go to that party, be at, be an effective person at that party. And I have particular anxieties about that when people raise questions like. Uh, the, the questions of animal histories and so on. I, I, I mean, as somebody who who's spent quite a long time on 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 the question of, um, of of animality, I understand what it means to observe animals and to make inappropriate um, uh, observations. But but what I think we are actually called to do, and this is just by example, this is where I'm going to end, is is not observe animals and make judgments on their behalf, but observe ourselves observing animals. In other words, take into account a space of freedom within which animals can inhabit. That space of freedom, by the way, I, I don't want to make, I don't want to be too emancipatory about that. If you eat animals. You, you have to understand that space of freedom is, is may not be a comfortable one for the animal. I mean, you have to be honest about that. I mean, I, I, I put that in as a moment of danger. In other words, I, I, it's the, uh, uh, no, there's one thing, therefore, uh, to eat a battery chicken and another thing uh, to eat a, um, a, a, a chicken that's been reared properly uh, and had the opportunity uh, to, ha to have some freedom. That, that's the point that I'm making. But I am concerned about being dragged into parties where I don't belong. Let me put the, then turn the question around that way as well. Uh, uh, that I don't want, I don't want to be forced to go to a party or don't want to be emancipated in ways that, uh, uh, that don't belong to me. And I, and, and, and so my, my I, I suppose the frame for this is that I have no problem within the public space of there being a multiplicity of individuals or groups or communities with histories some of those histories compete and each has to make a, 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 a claim within that public space for that competition and some lose and some win. I mean, I think that's, you, you began by naming the, the conflict in Eastern Europe at the moment and, and uh, I've been fascinated, grimly fascinated by the way in which um, the Kremlin has advanced, let's say, a historical narrative which we know to be false, we know to be fake, um, and yet which has a galvanizing effect, um, uh, 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 both uh, successful and unsuccessful. I mean, I'm just thinking of a new newspaper article this morning about how unsuccessful the, the Kremlin narrative has been among Russia, the Russian speaking community in the Donbass and so on. So that, that, that's, that I, I put that there that I, you know, uh, uh, the, the, whose party am I being invited to is my question, if you like. Thank you. Uh, Aaron, would you like me to fly uh, one by one, or do you want to collect questions? I don't know what is the procedure. Um, you, you can do it one by one, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for this uh, comment and question. I, I have to say I totally agree, right? I, I feel very uncomfortable with this fourth emotion. Uh, and that's why I, I said at the very beginning that even if I'm talking about the challenges uh, um, and the, the history that Mimi is facing right now, I, I am very loyal to my discipline, right? And uh, I think my um, uh, situatedness in Eastern uh, Europe has very much, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, influenced uh, this... this uh, uh, this um, this view, right? So I totally will agree with you that uh, we uh, we have to be very careful um, with uh, let's say um, situating us in discussion. And uh, what, for example, I see uh, that it's not necessarily the most visible in the discussions. This uh, let's say personal ethnography of history. Uh, and this idea that, of course, we as history are situated in a very particular context, and it's very nice to discuss, uh, you know, environmental problems and and uh, vegetarianism uh, in in at Stanford in this very pleasant, almost idyllic, academically atmosphere. But if you if you go back to Poland and Ukraine. 
and you will have a completely different point of view and completely different values should be put on, on top, I think. So think about nationalists, for example. We were fighting in, in history with nationalists, right? The idea of nationalistic uh, chauvinists for a long time, but if including Polish and Ukrainian nationalists, right? But if Ukrainians are not na nationalistic right now, they would lose the war. And what to do with that, right? So how now I ask myself, how I should position myself with these discussions about, you know, uh, nationalism, uh, which has definitely very bad sides and leads to um, killings and genocides. On the other hand, protected sides, like in Ukraine right now, right? So I, I do understand your, your concern, and uh, that's why I think um, it's important to somehow position yourself in these discussions, which is not necessarily often among historians, because I think that we still want to preserve the idea of objectivity. And of course, this is this is also fine with me. Right? I don't know if uh, if this uh, answer would, would satisfy your expectations, but I think that we are on the same side with, with this. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much. There are a lot of hands up, so I won't come back, but thank you. Um, Luke? Uh, thanks, Aaron. Uh, thank you, Eva. Um, I guess I want to start just by building on Lawrence's comment a bit. You know, uh, he put me in mind of George Orwell's remark, he who controls the past controls the future. And that's what's going on, I think, with uh, Putin and the, 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 the lies, essentially, that are coming out of the Kremlin about history. This is, I mean, Putin is, is coming up with a historical narrative, but it's not a historiographical narrative. And the, the answer to Putin's lies is just good, straight history, which tells the truth about the past, as far as I can see. Uh, the, the best way to rebut the, uh, the narrative of, of history coming out of the Kremlin is just solid historical research. And this is the... The, the fundamental difference, Putin's lies about history are the, what Hayden White called the practical past. You know, they, they've, they've got nothing to do essentially with uh, historiography, although you might find corrupt historians who'll back him up, but, but actually any authentic uh, uh, historical research will quickly prove that everything that Putin is saying is a complete fabrication. And all the people who are, who are behind him as well, like Dugin and so on, uh, who's getting a lot of attention at the moment as a kind of Kremlin propagandist. Um, so uh, from, from that point of view, building a little bit more on what you were saying, um, you know, history in the historiographic sense seems to be getting a lot of criticism from post-humanists and so on, but the idea that historiography is any kind of dominant attitude to the past, I, I, I actually am, am quite sceptical about this. It seems to me that History as historiography occupies a relatively marginal position in current culture insofar as it did legitimate imperialism as a discipline in the late 19th, early 20th century. Those days are long gone. The historical profession these days is extremely liberal and progressive to a fault. And uh, if you look at what um, is, is being done, the New York Times this week just published this whole thing on uh, the, the role of Western banking in, in Haiti and the, the, the way in which, you know, Haiti was made to pay back the slave owners for generations after the end of uh, slavery there, right the way through the 19th century and so on. I mean, this for me is, is, a, is, a, is a very good example of the kind of progressive contribution that proper historical research can make. Uh, where, you know, when, it, when it's done well in conjunction with public culture, but it, it doesn't suffer from any of the faults that are being attributed to it by people like uh, Chakrabarti and so on. Um, and on that note, uh, I, I think um, uh, Chakrabarti is confused about uh, historicism. When, I mean, when he says historicism was an injunction to the colonized to wait, it's true that somebody like John Stuart Mill is thinking that way in the later 19th century, but John Stuart Mill is operating with some sort of progressive narrative of history where, as a process, where there are sort of distinct stages of civilization that you pass through. 
That is not the conception of historical time that distinguishes historiography as we understand it now. And so, um, you know, Chakrabarti, again, is, I just think, off the mark with this, insofar as he's got a point. It relates to uh, a, a, a kind of 19th century thinking about the past, which was never historical in the technical sense anyway. And so my, my final uh, point is, is to do with um, the, the Paolo Haywood thing, which Chakrabarti also, I think, uh, makes the case in relation to India that, um, you know, we, we have to take Indian beliefs about spirits seriously. Um, I, I, I think it's very dangerous to take the view that all knowledge is of the same kind or of equal value and that, uh, you know, I, I do want to defend the difference between uh, folk belief, even though you need to be respectful of it, and knowledge that's the outcome of uh, research. I mean, I, I don't see what we gain, say, from postulating that the spirits help me with my research. It adds nothing to the process or the outcome. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem to be in any way uh, contributory to, to, to sort of mix uh, theoretical, analytical study of the past with uh, a very different orientation to it in practice. One is not a replacement for the other, but they're very different in kind. And it seems to me that these people are just confused over the nature of the difference, frankly. The, the historical and the practical orientation, to come back to that distinction, are, are just fundamentally distinct from one another. If you mix them up, nothing but confusion results. If you want to change the world, history in the technical sense won't do it. You need to change your relationship to your embodiment. If you want to be a better human being, if you want a better civilization, it starts from below the neck, not above the neck. This is, this is the, the, the great problem. There are all sorts of Asian practices, yoga, qigong, whatever, from India and China and so on, that Westerners are very ignorant of. If we all went out and did yoga every morning, I promise you the world would be a different place. You know? But we don't. So, you know, we, we shoot each other instead. If you just went out and sort of breathed deeply, you'd lose the urge to, in, to invade Ukraine, I promise. But Putin is, is not, um, you know, doing his Qigong, you know? There's, no, there's none of that happening in the Kremlin. So uh, th this is what we get, but it's not about history as such. Anyway, I'll stop. <laughs> Thank you, several points to, to, to respond to. Thank you. The, the, this is excellent. Uh, well, you know, first of all, I uh, totally agree that uh, historiography right now is uh, really progressing and we have very, very progressive fields within historical studies to mention on the, you know, the, the history of disabled, disability, gender history, queer history, visual history, and, and sonic history, uh, animal history, whatever, right? I mean, many, many, like, uh, new subfields uh, uh, of history we, uh, we see uh, right now, and many of them are very emancipatory, very progressive, uh, uh, very militant even, right? But still, from the point of view of historical profession, uh, they push history, you know, the, they push borders of history because they include different sources, different methods of, of uh, historical research, different historical, you know, approaches to, to, to problems, new research questions. There is no doubt about it. My question is that uh, when, for example, you talk about historicizing the animals, historicizing things, historicizing the subalters, you know, it's it's the way of neutralizing this this uh, uh, emancipatory revolutionary potential. And you know, personally, as, as a historian, as I said from the very beginning, I had nothing against it because I do want to uh, straight, right. That's exactly what 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 I said at the very beginning, and I I stay for it, right. So I want to be a historian, but you know, as a theorist of history, as I said. For me, uh, the question is, you know, this, this kind of neutralization of the uh, potential to actually change the, the way that people think about the past. And I think it has to do with your second question that historians 
uh, not necessarily like now, at least not what I see in East Central Europe. They are not very influential in shaping social consciousness, social perception of the past. They are placed by popular history written not by historians, because it might, you might have a great popular history written by historians. So, you know, the, the problem is that the, on one hand, we have problems within history. On the other, we are losing this, uh, the status that we used to have in society. So, that's why the memory politics is so successful. Because, because you know, the, the the society is really believing, believing. Why is it like that? This producing, you know, this phenomenal subfields, uh, very rich knowledge of the past. My question is, what is the relevance of this history? What is the influence of this, uh, this history on uh, social perception of the past and understanding? Uh, of, of the past. That's that's the problem, right? Now, again, uh, when you were talking about, you know, making hierarchies between religions and, as you said, folk beliefs. Oh, the anthropologists would not like that, as you might imagine. Right now, you do not suppose even to use the word magic when you talk about folk beliefs. There is nothing like folk belief, beliefs. You know, this is the anthropology from 19th century, which was, <laughs> which was, uh, which was really contributing to, you know, making these hierarchies between, you know, civilized people and under civilized and so on and so forth. So that's a very tricky problem. Uh, and of course, I learned from anthropologists, but I, as a historian, I do see your point. Right? I do see your point, because there is a difference uh, between monotheistic the religion, uh, religions and, and animistic beliefs, not from indigenous point of view, right? Because they, they would have a completely approach. They would say Christianization and civilization mission, which is Westernization, acculture, acculturation, and at the end, genocide of indigenous uh, settler and genocide of indigenous populations. So this is this is where the the argument would would end. Uh, and I tell you something, and I would like to to, uh, to share with you. One of the most uh, radical idea I recently uh, read about. I'm also doing relation. I'm also researching relationship between genocide and uh, and ecocide struggles. The concept of genocide has been colonized, which means that it's too anthropocentric because, from indigenous point of view, non-human beings are also persons might be things that might be animals like bisons, for example. So some indigenous scholars are talking about genocide of bisons, the, bi the bison genocide, no ecocide, no extermination. This would be a horrifying idea for genocide scholars in Europe, as you might imagine. Now, should I take it seriously? Or should I just dismiss it? Because who is actually talking seriously in Europe about bisons and the subject of genocide? This is just ridiculous. Well, yes, from European anthropocentric point of view, no, if we want to bridge some, somehow talk about Populist knowledges and Western knowledges. So that's that's the challenge, right? So I'm very careful about this concept of false beliefs. <laughs> right now, I learned my lessons speaking about the, you know, Lawrence who said about the false emancipation. I think that I was <laughs> falsely emancipated, and at least there was some uh, some some attempts to emancipate me from my Western worldview, more or less successfully. So. Um, also, I would uh, just add one, one more point. 
that we might actually think about how the idea uh, that coming from Latin America and Africa, like when the deer or Ubuntu, the philosophy of Ubuntu, might somehow help us to, uh, uh, to, to think uh, in a similar terms about the human condition and the condition of the world. But I, I totally agree with you that it would not really help us in any way to think about the conflict between Ukraine and, and Russia, right? It would not help in any way. So uh, my primary concern right now is rather, you know, what we can do as historians, uh, uh, because uh, with this knowledge which is coming from Kremlin, right? And as you said, uh, the proper historical research would definitely challenge all these claims. But the problem is, uh, if this historical research are really valuable for society right now, and who actually read this historical research, right? Who is participating in this mass of events which are going on around the world with historians who are this, uh, political scientists who are who are uh, you know trying to analyze the situation and and somehow straight it out, you know who who is uh, uh, telling the lies and, and so on and so forth. So uh, yes, that's, that's, that's the challenge. Yeah, I, I will definitely <laughs> think more about that. Thank you. Um, David? Yes, thank you. Um, if, I, if I may, I think there's something missing in your paper that uh, worried me. Um, a, a central theme that runs through it is um, looking for means of discovery of different historicities. Um, but I'm wondering if we can talk about historicity without talking about historical consciousness, which I didn't hear in your paper. I, I think this occurred to me when it came to the history of animals. And, and the problem if we take historical consciousness as a, a component of what we mean by historicity, animals, we have real methodological problems there. The paradox is, of course, that historical consciousness itself has a history, a historicity. And, and so it doesn't simply mean one thing either. I, I had written myself a note here, do I really mean to say that ancient historians had no historical consciousness <laughs> and yet could write history? I, I thought maybe we can get around that. They wrote history for, pur for a purpose. They were doing something for a purpose, but did they have historical consciousness? So the question of limit, the limits of historical consciousness come in in, in some sense. But I think even taken looking for ways of taking seriously different uh, cultures with different values, different epistemologies, whatever. Um, I guess I would ask you as an anthropologist how one might approach uh, a different culture looking for that different historical consciousness. Thank you. Well, you know, I thank you very much for this question, which again, uh, all these uh, questions are very challenging and thanks, I, I really appreciate all of them because as I said, this is a work in progress and I'm just struggling, as you can see, <laughs> I'm struggling this, with these uh, ideas. So uh, I think when, when you ask about historical consciousness, I think it also has to do how you uh, understand the, the, the principles of historical consciousness. What does it mean to have historical consciousness? Uh, well, you know, to, to be conscious of uh, changes in time, or is it something more sophisticated? And speaking about the particular context of your question, right? You know, we can't go into, you know, the general, what the historical consciousness 
could mean in in the uh, in I'm sorry, this was the question for you, uh, because I would like to, you know, hear more, you know, what uh, what are the principles of historical consciousness? How we, how we can, from your point of view, uh, identify is if somebody has historical consciousness or not? I, I, I would respond quickly. I think one of the fundamental drivers of historical consciousness is an awareness of change. And, and you had brought up time as one of the factors working through there, um, but it's a sense of what it means to live in time. And, and, and perhaps a strong, I would say a strong sense that it means to live with change and, and, and the, how that is perceived as a challenge. Yes. Uh, so I understand that in the context of uh, animal studies, you you ask about the uh, historical consciousness uh, of uh, scholars who are uh, like approaching animals, right? Because obviously <laughs> animals do not have historical consciousness, but they might have perception of change. And you know, my my question was how what we can for example biological status uh, trans species uh, psychology about the perception a different perception of change which is not necessarily human uh, so that's why for example the idea of generation is so interesting because you know the some animals might have this uh, perception of who is the older in a group who is the younger right so I, I was wondering if the idea of generation might not be this kind of bridging concept that uh, changing time in a different way. So that that's, uh, that's what could be one uh, possibility. And of course, different timing, uh, which are related, for example, to rhythms, um, this uh, the rhythmic time could be also an uh, interesting point. Not speaking about uh, sensing changes, you know, how, how for example, uh, 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 we are sensing the uh, passing of time and the animals are sensing it. That's, uh, um, that's uh, this would go into, let's say, emotional history, sensory history, that's, that could be a possibility, but you know, coming back to your question about historical consciousness, I would never say that that, that animals, any animals, uh, except except uh, human beings, have historical consciousness as we understand it. But you know, different animals, uh, human and non-human, have a particular perception of time. The question is, what is time and how how it is approached. So I do not have any definite questions, but I would definitely, you know, if I would like to research this uh, problem in details, I would go to uh, case studies and, for example, examine, uh, let's say, elephant's perception of change versus human perception of change in a very concrete uh, and multi-species ethnography is about so ethnographers are doing uh, research on the subjects in uh, uh, like sanctuariums or in in uh, in some uh, places inhabited by animals are, and do, doing this research and also i have to say that uh, uh, this question and thank you again also from the point of view of human epistemic authority of knowledge production. I mean, the main challenge for, for historians that are coming from animal studies is the idea that not only humans might uh, create a knowledge of the past. 
And it has to do using, for example, sign language when communicating with like like uh, uh, certain uh, um, certain kinds of chimpanzees, and how. And this is already done by uh, uh, scholars working on animal uh, behavior. Uh, how we on this as testimonies, and that's a great challenge. Um, which, which also challenged the idea of historical source and historical testimony. Because uh, as, as I said, you know, there was already some articles uh, published by, uh, by scholars working on uh, primatology, which com communicated with, uh, with animals and get some uh, with chimpanzees and get knowledge about dust. And this uh, brought a lot, a lot of, uh, you know, discussions. So again, you know, a lot of interesting uh, ideas. No, I do not think that his, uh, that animals have, uh, we might have, uh, have associated in any way historical uh, consciousness to, to animals. But we can talk about, you know, perception of change and perception of... Um, Bob? Are you there, Bob? Uh, we'll go straight to Moira. Then. Oh, I no, I got it. I got it. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Thank you very much for the. There's so much there. It's just impossible to do four things that I want to do at once. Uh, I can't resist the comment about his, the history of dogs. Why not turn it around and ask yourself what you learn about your own sense of historicity? by having trouble figuring out whether dogs have history or not. But of course, historians and anthropologists and sociologists aren't going to do that because they don't think of themselves as improving their own consciousness by what they do, just their knowledge. And that really is where my question lies. I don't think anybody alive has a problem with historical relativism. That's an intellectual problem you can entertain different historicities as if they were your own, but you are living only one. The reference to Putin would be misleading in this case because the story he tells is meant to be a kind of theory of history, but the, the history he's actually living is not the same one. That's what you would get if you thought of the way in which you're living out a history. In other words, the way, the way I see it, this, having a history is more like having a native language. You can learn a second one. You can even contemplate trying to make that second one mostly your first one, the way my parents did when they immigrated. Um, but you're stuck with how you already got inherited in the first place. And to then think, I'm going to change that by learning more about other ways of thinking may change your thinking, but that alone doesn't really change who you are. For me, the really important question would be, given all the new information that we now have about other cultures, about the possibility of other species having, having passed, all the things you mentioned, how would I translate all of that knowledge into something which changes me in the process of knowing it, rather than just knowing it, which doesn't change anything? Thank you very much. Uh, well, I, I have to say that I, uh, I'm not sure if I agree with you, uh, because, uh, you know, for example, learning a different language is also somehow uh, imposing on you different epistemology. So, you know, my native language is Polish, my second language is English, but you said that it would not change who you are, it changed me who I am. And I tell you why, because for example, Polish language is very like, you know, labyrinthian. You never go to the point directly. English language, especially in academia, is very concrete and direct. What happened to me when I started to teach at Stanford and I become somehow, you know, I started to think in language, in English, excuse me. I become a different person from the point of view. I become more direct which means in my culture, more aggressive as a woman. 
because you know i go you know i go directly to the point i had to learn how to concrete so you know it changes my somehow personality too you know i had to i had to become a different person you know performing at least to be a different person because i would not survive in this academia right so that that that's i would not agree and now the question is what would have it different means of communications not only linguistic communications and for example be more open to biocommunications with animals and plants right for example people have uh, dogs but do, they do not really learn how to communicate well with dogs they train them but if they would for example read a little bit about behavior about you know what signs including chemical signs you know smells and and gestures and and look and different movement mean for for a dog they would be much much more successful with understanding what what is going on with the dog let's say and that's the challenge we are not willing to do that you know this is this is this is exactly the problem so I am very much interested in this alternative thing with, uh, with animals, but also with people. You know, talk about this, all you know, history between us, but we've heard that this is a real, real chemistry, it means that people who like each other, um, they have said they evaporate in smells and uh, also uh, they behave in a certain way, but we tend to to then in let's say body language or other senses right i mean we are aware of it but i have a feeling that i i always want to put something in words because from my point of view this would be more more credible if I say that, I mean that that's a different that's an interesting problem. You also history as told and history as living different thing. Well, but you know the the people who are like in Ukraine living in this lies that uh, Putin is telling you know this lies the history as told in a reality. Uh, so mm -hmm. I do not uh, see that there is you no know, very strange appreciation between history as thought and history as living or maybe i understood it misunderstood you so if i did i apologize if i misunderstood your your intentions but um yeah so this is what i wanted to say that uh... um more Yes, thank you. And thank you, Eva, for your presentation. I have two short questions, uh, like for clarification, maybe. One is, at some point you said, how can history be prevented? And I understood from the context that you were referring not so much to history as a discipline, but to history as what will happen in the world, <laughs> in a way, uh, when you were talking about um, like this idea that you are working on on future oriented and cooperative and other approaches to how like getting ready in other ways to what the challenges that are coming so i wanted maybe to ask you to clarify what you meant by this idea of preventing history and the second point is related to some of the questions to robert and, and david's questions because i was surprised to see that you were not talked or not you didn't refer to temporality much to notions of temporality and i understand that or i i think that uh, temporality is a good example of these limits in i don't know if we should say cross-cultural intercultural whatever cultural um, conversations and exchanges um, because of the profoundly different notions of temporality that we have. So that could be an important limitation in, in the sense that Robert was mentioning just now. And also because temporality has been one of the most important instruments of the colonization of the mind and imp the imposition of 
a certain notion of temporality, the universalization of a certain notion of temporality. So I was wondering if you have thought of some place for temporality in these ideas that you are sketching now, or if, if it was there all along and I just didn't see it, or well, any thoughts on that? Thank you very much. This is true that I, uh, as you might know, uh, with the group, I work with uh, preventive humanities, right? But I am, we are actually thinking about knowledge of the past, that the particular knowledge of the past they might be preventive. And my, and my, our question is, um, is it any way that we might uh, uh, create knowledge that would somehow serve as a kind of shield, uh, social shield, uh, and make society more resilient, right? More resilient for uh, and more adaptable for uh, for the uh, uh, crises. Uh, ongoing crises, right, and 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 uh, post potential catastrophes, um, and uh, well, you know, uh, the idea is that perhaps um, so art practices might help here because uh, you know some images, well, the music might play some role. Images, not only written texts. Uh, might somehow uh, create social imaginary. And of course, this is not, but uh, we, we refer to uh, uh, the project by Ariel History. And Ariel, when she is, uh, um, she is uh, researching, Palestinian Israeli conflict, which is a long lasting conflict, creates a kind of citizens uh, It contains a photographs showing positive, uh, positive examples, operation, cohabitation, uh, 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 common businesses, uh, mixed marriages between Israeli and Palestinians in the past, right? And she said, by going around with this exhibit uh, of these images, uh, she was trying to establish a kind of idea that the, uh, the different future is possible, that there were these good examples of. Uh, of uh, of course, you know, co uh, 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 of Polish cooperation between Israeli and Palestinians uh, in the past, and it could be like in the future. We just have to infuse social imagination with more positive uh, images and ideas and texts, uh, and not only focus on this uh, very difficult even on the right of, of violence. So uh, there is some interesting points that she's making. So for example, this about avoiding talking about violent conflicts, that's not about that. But it's a matter of, uh, of focus, right? So for example, when we are exploring ideas of the um, situation of minorities in countries or, or gender relations and so on and so forth. We focus on conflicts and, and, and the oppression. We also should uh, think more about these positive images that might actually uh, make the social perception of the situation a little bit different in the future and infuse it with hope that the different, as I said, the diff different future is possible. And of course, it might be idealistic, but it's not, it's not uh, utopian from, let's say, totalitarian point of view, because it's all about, you know, localities. It's not the idea that we all have to do it and all focus on this uh, positive images, positive ideas. 
but it's about when you when you do local start a lot of studies about your local environment when you research these problems let's let's think about oppression as well as you know the positive uh, examples of cohabitation and uh, as an image concept right so that's that's might be prevented from the point of view uh, of creating some hope in a different future but also as i said the images the ideas that would make the society more resilient that's why in this project that i published in history and theory which is called uh, prefigurative history uh, we are talking i am talking about i'm coming back to the idea of, of apotropaic texts uh, how we can you know uh, think about the uh, knowledge of the past that has this apotropaic value value it's like protecting us it's like a prayer it's like a meditation as a kind of possibility right i'm not saying you know let's do history like that i'm just if there is a space in the historical discipline for this kind of of exercises um um so yes so that was one question the question of temporality well you know i have a feeling that we talk about different uh, alternative temporalities for a long time and for example think what happened with julia christieva's idea of women's time right you know we these ideas were flowing around for decades I don't know how each other they were on historical studies. I have a feeling that we, in, in the dominant tendencies of, of history, we're still in this kind of, you know, uh, linear temporality with a kind of theological premise, right? And of course, uh, uh, it depends what you are working on. So we are talking about, you know, if you are working on anthropocenic history, and, and the Anthropocene as a kind of environmental changes, climate change, you have to talk about, you know, this geologic time, right? And it's our perception of historical time. If you are, you know, in economic history, you have these different uh, uh, times. That's, that's obvious. I don't want to, you know, uh, repeat this. But, you know, my, my question is, for example, uh, what would happen if historians would read more about how uh, we the, the idea of time is discussed right now in physics and how this idea of, of uh, the time that might, let's say, come back. I don't know how to reverse our time, which is very popular in physics right now, might uh, somehow change our uh, uh, idea of what time and time, right? And the, the question of temporality is very different, uh, important. And I see the point. I see that the idea, uh, since the idea of temporality is strictly related to historicity, once we challenge temporality, we challenge historicity and vice versa. Is um, what would be of the outcome of it? And this would be, you know, what is the ethics of this change temporality, right? I mean, that's what would be, uh, what what would be the responsible approach to uh, our relation to time, and if there is something like unethical approach? Because I always, you know, have this potential outcome uh, in mind. Is it any uh, idea of a uh, a different temporality that, for example, is uh, is um, uh, not for, but as a potential income of of uh, of society. So you know, I I feel that, for example, right now history is becoming more also of interest for security studies. And you know the question uh, of securitization of history, and how history might be secured from the point of view, uh, like we are talking about food security, 
and uh, and climate security and soil security. I'm not speaking about military security here, right? That's that's a different thing. But you know, is it anything we might we should do about securitization of history as a discipline? Should we preserve history and what kind of history we should preserve? Uh, that's the question for me. And also, uh, you know, that's why the temporality is definitely uh, the problem. Um, and, uh, and yes, uh, yes, I should explore it more. You are absolutely right that this was not probably enough of this. Uh, thank you. Um, I think we've sadly run out of time. So um, thank you again to Ava for her fascinating paper. Uh, thank you to everyone for coming. That was a really interesting discussion today. Um, and I look forward to seeing you all again uh, next week. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much for our, our questions. I note uh, everything down and I will you know, definitely work through them. Thank you so much again for inviting Thank you, me. Thank for, you so for much. This. Thank Bye. you.